awareness of God's presence here right now and every time, every place that we occupy. In that awareness, let us pray. Father, Mother, God, we give thanks for this opportunity to be open and receptive to your love, your guidance, We set aside all of those fears and tribulations that we have in this moment and invite your presence here, now. We allow your love to fill us, to spill out from us, to lighten each corner of our darkened consciousness. clarify, purify, transform us in this moment. As we breathe into this moment, we feel this transformation occurring. We feel our burdens lighten. We feel our joy upon us, shifting our countenance, clarifying our thoughts, And for, some, for those in our experience who seem to have a need for the awareness of your love, of your presence in their lives, we hold them in consciousness and see them blessed, see them lifted, see them transformed by the inflow of your love. And for those seemingly in need of healing, we change our minds. We see them whole, complete, healed. We see them blessed. And for this awareness, we give thanks. And so it is that together we say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I honor you. And now the question is, do you honor you? Do you individually honor yourself? Let's just take a moment and recognize that we each are a product of our experiences. We're a product of our blessings. We're a product of our own thoughts. And however successful we may think that we have been, let us realize in this moment that we are the expression of God in this moment. Yay, God. All right, so it's been an interesting week in politics, eh? As some of you know, uh, perhaps not everyone, but I'll just make the declaration. I enjoy my conversations on Facebook. 
right? Some of you may not have been aware of that. But, uh, and and uh, politics is not something that I do here. Um, it's on Facebook that I do politics, uh, mostly on Facebook. <coughs> and uh, surprisingly, my opinions are not shared by everyone. That's an interesting thing about Facebook is that I, I find that out. Um, and uh, so I'll have to admit that sometimes I can be fairly strident. Um, and uh, there is a, uh, an environment on Facebook which allows me to test my tolerance for adverse opinions. Now, how many of you are active on Facebook? So let me just let me just set the stage for everyone that everyone here because it's going to be relevant for a couple reasons. Number one, um, as director of marketing for Unity Worldwide Ministries, I am involved in uh, creating a marketing process that can be replicated across the Unity movement. Uh, here in Colorado, we have Unity of Colorado, which is an association of Unity Ministries here in the Colorado area, not surprisingly, being called Unity of Colorado. And so we're going to be using Unity of Colorado and uh, the ministries here as a test bed for some social media marketing that's going to be developed here over the course of the next three or four months that we can then pick this model up and replicate through the, through the Unity movement. And so I'm going to be asking for uh, wide participation among our community in this effort so that we can test to see whether or not this, this process is going to be effective. But secondly, um, it's relevant for my talk this morning because what I'd like to do in this talk this morning is explore our tolerance uh, for adverse opinions and for adverse values. Because those are different, right? I mean, we, we know that values represent the foundation of our opinions, but our, our values tend not to change. Our values tend to be fairly constant. Uh, they, they evolve from a value set that our parents gave us, that our, um, that our early childhood experience gave us. And our opinions tend to flow and flux depending upon the conditions, uh, depending upon our mood, depending upon uh, who our friends are, and so on. So I'd like to explore that realm today. And Facebook is an interesting environment because it gives us the opportunity to test our sense of values, test our tolerance for adverse opinions. Um, now, for those of you not involved in Facebook, there is this thing called Facebook. <laughs> and, and when you log on to Facebook, what you have is a, uh, a friends list. And that friends list may be small, may be large. Uh, but when you have a friends list, what appears on your Facebook page is this thing called a news feed. And the news feed is actually coming from your various friends. They will be ma making a post, they'll be making an entry in Facebook, and it will appear on their friends list. And likewise, when I make a post, it will appear on my friends list. Uh, it'll appear on the news feed of my friends. And uh, so when, when I make a post, uh, that post can uh, appear on my friends list, news feed, and they can either ignore it, they can respond to it, they can like it or they can share it. Um, and oftentimes uh, I see posts on my news feed that I'll ignore. But there are some that come up, I say, wow, that, you know, that, I, that's a funny thing or I love that or I like that um, or I'm sad about that. Uh, but I can respond to it with a like. And then if, if I'm really excited about a post and I say, yeah, that's the way I feel. I'd like to repost that, I can share that. And in my sharing of that post, it goes on to my friend's newsfeed, not all of them, but Facebook has some kind of formula determining that. But, 
Um, so that post goes out and it's multiplied. Well, in our marketing effort, we're going to be using that particular sharing capability to get the message out, our marketing message out. But in terms of, of the talk this morning, this opportunity, as I look at my news feed and I see these posts from various friends, and I respond to a post, that post response shows up on their feed, and all of their other friends can also respond, and so we get into a conversation. I may be talking to some dude I've never met before, and we'll be uh, talking back and forth about a particular topic, expressing our opinions, our opinions being based upon our values. And if she has a different set of values than I have, then our opinions may not be the same. And depending upon the degree of, of, of uh, emotional investment that we have in these opinions, those conversations can be interesting. Well, okay. So Facebook gives us an opportunity to see our tolerance for other opinions. But think about your own relationships. Now, I know that there are siblings, I know from personal experience, that there are siblings who question the fatherhood of their brothers or sisters because their values and their opinions seem to be so vastly different that this can't possibly be coming from the same gene pool, right? Um, so, so in our familial uh, relationships, we also see this question of, you know, to what degree am I tolerant of various opinions that are shared by my crazy uncle or my, uh, or my uh, 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 radical nephew or whomever. So as we look at how we respond to these various opinions, will give us a sense of am I being open and receptive to what is. You see, when I have a, when I put out a post and I see a response that comes back that, that, that says, well, obviously you've got your head, uh, well, I won't finish that phrase, but um, it gives me the opportunity to say, well, okay, uh, is this person's opinion, is it uh, valid? Is it something I need to pay attention to or is it something I uh, should ignore? Is it something that I can respond to in a constructive way or is it something that, that I feel compelled to respond to in what might turn out to be a destructive way? Facebook has such a low uh, threshold of investment in these relationships that it's really actually a, a good test bed for us to consider well, how tolerant am I? Am I open and receptive? Or am I fairly strident in my, in my positions? Well, here's an interesting exercise. And uh, in fact, before we, before we go through the exercise, let's, let's just take a look at this affirmation, okay? And, and I, I put this affirmation up several, uh, uh, six or eight weeks ago, and uh, it's uh, perhaps something for us to revisit as we enter into this last stage of the election process. So read, read this with me. God as divine order is moving in and through our election process. Peace, love, and joy abound. God, as divine order, is moving in and through our election process. Peace, love, and joy abound. Sometimes I have a hard time remembering that, right? Uh, particularly as I'm into the middle of a, uh, a, of a conversation. But here's an interesting exercise that I'd like to take us through. And uh, it's illustrative on uh, at least a couple of levels. So we'll start with uh, 2 John. Now, this letter, uh, 2 John, uh, letter G 1, 2, and 3 John, was, were written 
probably by an elder of the Johnine community uh, after the Gospel of John was written. It turns out that the Johnine com community had a split and there were some people in that community that left because they felt that the community itself was not expressing what they understood the teachings of John and the teachings of Jesus to be. So there was this split in the Johnine community. And John 1, 2, and 3 were letters that were thought to be written by one of the elders of the intact community to the followers of that community to hold them together. Okay, in that context, we'll see. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. That is part of the, the, the people that have left the community. Those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Ooh, getting a little bit uh, strident here. Be on your guard so that you do not lose what we have worked for, but may receive a full reward. Everyone who does not abide in the teachings of Christ but goes beyond it does not have God. Whoever abides in the teachings has both the Father and the Son. Do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. For to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. That is to say, in today's context, unfriend that dude. Get him out of your friends list. You don't want to see any posts that that fellow has to, has to make. Or if he's not on your friends list, block that dude. You don't want to see his opinion because his opinion's just going to, to uh, contaminate your consciousness. Okay, so that's an interesting perspective coming from the New Testament, the New Testament being supposedly the um, undefiled word of God, right? Okay, so let's go to another teacher. Now, the, the uh, community of Peter, um, this letter came from, whoop, came from one of the elders in the uh, Petrine community. And finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you may inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from the evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to, those, to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Okay, so in today's context, that would be either ignoring the post or blessing the person. You know, I, I appreciate your perspective, but I don't share it. And uh, may you have a, a wonderful life. You may still block the person. But nonetheless, it's, it's a matter of, of seeing the blessing in the various opinions, even if they are adverse to your own. So there's another uh, epistle that was written in about the same time frame as the letters of 1, 2, and 3 John, maybe 15, 20 years later, but in the whole context of the timeline of humanity, uh, not, not uh, uh, far different. So here we have two positions. And these two positions are, in fact, very different, are they not? So when you look at the letters of the New Testament and you say, well, which do I believe? How do you know? I mean, they're supposed to be the inerrant word of God, both of them. So how, how do we decide how we respond to our weird brother or our crazy uncle or our um, obviously off-track aunt? Well, we might go back to some of the fundamental teachings of Jesus. And the fundamental teachings of Jesus that are relevant, I mean, they're spread throughout the New Testament, but I... I'm not going to take up four hours of your time to comment upon all of those passages. I will, however, go back to Matthew. 
Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? I, sometimes I have a hard time with that one. Um, or how do you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So here we have what is considered to be an authentic teaching of Jesus, although it was written some 60 years, uh, I'm sorry, 40 years after uh, the crucifixion. But nonetheless, this is considered to be one of the fundamental uh, teachings of Jesus. So as we look at the passages in the New Testament, or Old Testament for that matter, and we consider ourselves to be Christian, which most people in unity do consider themselves to be Christian, then we go back to the fundamental teachings that are, that are considered to be authentic, and we say, okay, how does this measure up? So we might, in fact, compare this to 1 Peter. And what would we come up with? Well, 1 Peter and this, fairly close, right? Have unity of spirit, sympathy, and love for one another, a tender heart and a humble mind. However, if we look at 2 John, we might see that, whoops, this guy, um, hmm, do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. For to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. So we might say, well, okay, so Matthew, uh, being as it is, do not judge. We, we need to step a little bit deeper into that passage and say, well, what does that really mean? What is the real effect of that? As we consider those adverse opinions that are heaped upon us, it's not that we avoid them. We can ignore them, but avoiding them is something different, right? Avoiding them is just not even considering them. If we look at the passage and we say, or if we look at the opinion and say, we don't agree with that, we can then say, all right, now that I don't agree with that, how do I respond? Do I respond by questioning the heritage of the individuals uh, that offered the response? Do I suggest that that person is uh, not grounded in reality and that they really need to check in with, uh, with what the real world is? Or do I respond in a way that helps them not necessarily see the light, but helps them release their strong attachment to their opinion. But if we're going to be authentic, and this is where I have great challenge, if we're going to be authentic, we also need to let go of our strong attachment to our opinion. We can still have the opinion. We can still be strong. We can still be passionate about our opinion, but we don't need to be attached to it. Does that make sense? That is, we can say, this opinion is really what works for me. I've seen it in my life. It's reflected in my experience. It is solidly based in my values but I don't need to force this opinion on anyone else by declaring their obvious inability to reason functionally because they disagree with this opinion, right? So this has been an interesting exploration for me. And in my observation of my own attachment to my own opinions, I will still be passionate. I know that. 
But I am going to practice detachment of that opinion, allowing the passion to be there, but not necessarily requiring anyone else to share that passion. Does that make sense? As we go through this final month of the election, we're going to have the opportunity to enhance our relationships or perhaps even destroy our relationships. How are we going to move through that? And what is going to be the state of our consciousness throughout the process and on November 9th? It really is a choice. And the way that we proceed is truly up to us. We'll have our meditation. As we allow ourselves to enter into this moment and recognize that this moment is pristine. It is unencumbered by anything that has happened in the past. It is filled only with that which we bring into it. And so in this moment, let us come in without the baggage of our experience. Let us come in unfettered. Let us come in light, pure, an expression of God here, now. breathe into this moment and just experience the being of the now. How does that feel? Is it empty? Or is it possibly filled with God. Perhaps when we do not impose our experience on this moment and just let the moment be, perhaps we have the opportunity to experience the beingness of God. We allow our fears to be set aside and come into this moment. Maybe we come into this moment and experience love, unconditional, all-embracing, permeating to the very essence and emanating from the very essence of who we are children of the divine, expressions here in this moment of God. allowing the awareness of the presence of God to move through every aspect of our consciousness. 
every cell of our body. this awareness allowing all of that which is happening to happen not resisting but transforming transforming through the eyes of love unconditional ever present And we give thanks. And as we come back into this time and space, let us come back sharing the words of Alleluia.